morning Things ain't what they used to be Fred Lowry was one of the best vocalist organist in town, so today our guest is the legendary blues singer-songwriter. Yeah, I can hear you. All right, we got it now. We got it. We got it now. How you doing, Mr. Lowry? I'm doing fine. How you doing? All right, we got you on now. And uh, today is my latest edition of Mr. Rick's Place, and we got a fantastic and a, a legendary guitarist, singer, I'm the owner of the Big Bo Thomas Band back in the heyday, back in 1950, 65. And he was a vocalist, right? And a guitar. Yeah, vocalist, and I played the organ and guitar also. Okay. All right. So you get to be settled down a little bit now. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And, you know, uh, on this show, we uh, try to talk to a lot of people, and I'm trying to find out, and a lot of stuff that's kind of been put in limbo around on uh, music, about the music scene in Dallas is not really uh, written down. A lot of it's not charted down. It's a lot of stuff that's kind of held back because, you know, back in the day, we didn't have a lot of technology and stuff like we do now. And then we got a lot of people basically kind of digging all this stuff up. We found yeah. out they had a lot of record companies back in the day. You know, they had a lot of record companies, you know. So one of the, one of the first questions I'm going to ask you, Mr. Larry. Um, now, when were you born and where were you born at? I was born in Dallas in 1937. All right. So I'm a... Uh... I remember when Pearl Harbor got bombed. <laughs> <laughs> now, when did you start taking up music now? When I was about 15, we went to see a group called Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. Mm -hmm. I had a guitar player with them named Cal Green. And when I saw him playing for that group, I had a little doo-wop group, so I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So I bought me a guitar and tried to learn it. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you have any formal training? Do you have anybody really that kind of took you up on the wings and wanted to try to teach you to play? No. What I did, I bought me a book. And I just, just kept picking on it until I got something, got something out of it like the blues okay now what high school you go to now booker t washington booker t washington high school yeah that was kind of like it was just two in dallas right then wasn't it yeah, it was two uh booker t and lincoln and then later on madison came madison. in yeah yeah i went to madison yeah back in oh, you? yeah i graduated in 71. uh okay now you said you didn't have any kind of formal training but did you get in the band uh high school band yeah. When I was in the high school, I played in the I played saxophone in the band. Mm -hmm. And that was all the music uh, training I had. But it, it seemed like I could kind of understand music. I know my nephew was in college one time, and he was taking an exam. And I never had any music training like that, but I helped him pass that exam. Hmm. So I did have an understanding of music. Yeah, so you basically you sound like you know a little bit about theory and the chord structure and chord progressions. Yeah, I know chord, uh, uh, the chords. I, I don't know 
one time Bobby Samuels, he was a, a saxophone player with the Red Tops. Really? And uh, he asked me, did I know the chords, the, the, the uh, notes and the chords? And all of a sudden I knew them. <laughs> okay, now, when all this is going around, I know a lot of people, you know, you started in church. I know you played a little bit in church too, right? Uh, that was the worst mistake right there. The best people with the soul uh, usually I did. I just started at a friend of mine's house. We got a little group together and started singing doo-wops. Uh, go back and repeat what you said a little bit, Mr. Lyra. I didn't hear you. I said, uh, Church. I didn't sing in church. We got in house and formed a group. That's the way we started singing. That's the way I started singing. Okay. I didn't have any church singing or nothing like that, mm -hmm. which is the best way to learn how to sing. So that's, that's the third question I really want to ask you about the groups now. I know a lot of people start off with one, two players. They, you got a friend to play. He might play a guitar. You might play the bass. He may be the drum. And all of a sudden, y'all start kicking together at nighttime in the garage or in your house. And basically, your parents get kind of tired of hearing the same noise. And one y'all go outside. And then when you go outside, <laughs> people hear you outside. And then they come up to you and say, not you start a group? So. Yeah. Uh, so basically, did that start with you, or did anybody? Well, even what ask? I started with was a singing group. Uh -huh. When I when I played guitar for the singing group, and uh, the first band I played with was with a guy named Frank Shelton, and his vocalist was ZZ Hill. So ZZ talked me into uh, playing guitar in the band. Mm -hmm. That's the way I started in a band. Z Z and then I got with Jack Dixon. Uh -huh. Then I got with Big Bo. Big Bo. So all this was going on, you basically say the the elder statesmen and them are the most uh, already established artists was trying to get in touch with you to try yeah. to hook up with you. Right. That's the way it started. So I was saying that I saw a car. I heard a couple of these recordings. You got an excellent singing voice, man. So basically the way it looks like you started off being a vocalist first, right? Well, I, yeah, I started off in the singing group as a vocalist, right? Okay. All right, now you are like a second tenor, first tenor. First no, I was a lead in the, yeah, first tenor and I found lead vocalist. Lead vocals, yeah, yeah. Okay, now. It's kind of leading up to some of my main questions I want to ask you now. And, uh, how was the long, did the music scene in Dallas last? And basically, who was the beginning of these big bands in, in Dallas? Now, who was uh, kind of like the... the well, the, the, the main guy that started uh, was Howard Lewis. Uh, he was the big booking agent in town. And he did all the concerts. Uh, uh, he did, as a matter of fact, he got a grandson, John Lewis, that's playing. Uh, he plays in a band now. He's got his own jazz group. Yeah, I know John. Me and John played together in a, in a group. You know, I met John. I met John. I know John. John is a good friend of mine. Grace, I've been knowing John for so many years. We, yeah, John we, is an excellent player. Yeah. He's a, and then he's, he's a businessman. He knows how to wrap things up together, you know, especially with the writing part and the, and the production. He's a smart guy. He's yeah, really he's a smart guy. guy. Yeah. So you say his granddaddy was like a uh, promoter, right? Yeah. yeah. Granddaddy was the promoter. He booked all of the concerts at the Sportatorium. That's where they used to hold the concerts. Uh -huh. uh, we played that one time with uh, Fats Domino. When I had my singing group, we sang on that with Fats Domino. Uh -huh. But I, you know, I. 
Okay, now you saying now uh, he started. I've uh, been with a lot of guys. Evidently. Uh, did you have any kind of like any competitions, uh, issues and stuff like? I know uh, Ray Charles was around here in town, and he was kind of like uh, pulling a lot of guys out of the band. You know, you, you know, you know, a lot of people do that. They are uh, they uh, they know one person plays in the band, they got their eyes on this certain person right. because it's something that he wants. You know, right. in my neighborhood, Ray Charles, I used to see him practicing around the corner at what they call a minor court. Him and Robert Moss and uh, uh, Lord Folsom and all those guys used to yeah. practice around there before they got famous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we played with a lot of guys uh, when I was at the Ascot room. We would. Okay, now now you're some of the clubs around here in Dallas now. Well, the clubs when I was in Dallas it was just the Zanzibar and uh Gemini, it opened up later on, but yeah, Gemini opened up later on. Yeah. On yeah. Avenue, right? Uh, so on Southern Avenue. Yeah, yeah, right. That's where it was. Gemini Club, yeah. Yeah. But you know, uh, Ike Turner tried to get me to play with his band one time. Lord Price, uh, Bill Doggy did too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was girl crazy, so I didn't want to go nowhere. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, we played with uh, uh, Etta James, Ike and Tina. Played with uh, uh, Joe Simon, Sam and Dave, Clarence Carter, I can name Bobby Bland, Bo Diddley, The Drifters, Little Willie John, The Impressions, Barry Church, uh, Chuck Berry, just, uh, just Lou Johnson, just tons of them because, you know, every week we had a different artist in the club. And back in the day, the black artists didn't travel with the band. They used to come to town on a Friday, and we would have rehearsal that Friday, and we played with them that Saturday and Sunday. So that's the reason we got to play with so many artists. So you want to say you had about one of days of practicing, right, with them? I mean, yeah, we had one day to practice. That was Friday evening. Friday evening. Yeah, Johnny Taylor. He, both of those Johnny Taylors. Well, you know, Johnny, Johnny Taylor. <laughs> A lot of people don't know that it was two Johnny Tellers, right? Yeah, little Johnny Teller put, I'm going to find me a part-time love. That's yeah. the only hit he had. Yeah, I know about that song. He had a little high squeaky voice, didn't he? <laughs> he did. Yeah. yeah. He was squeaky, too. <laughs> All right, now tell me, tell me a little stories, man. I know you know a lot of stories, man, about what happened in music back in those days. Uh, well, you know, notorious and so wicked, like some of the people say they were, man. You know, uh, well, I heard a lot of stories, it. man, about Johnny Taylor, man, how crazy he was, man, and how uh, he put some of the singles out on the road sometime, and man. Well, let me tell you, one time when Ike and Tina was in town. Uh, we were upstairs in the dressing room, and Tina was up there. Ike told me, go on upstairs. I'll be up there in a minute. So I went upstairs, and this guy came uh, upstairs because the restroom was right up under there. And he used the wrong door and came upstairs, and Tina told him the restroom was downstairs. So when he was on his way downstairs, Ike was on his way upstairs. He mm. turned around and knocked five from Tina. Oh man. <laughs> he slapped her so hard and she said, Oh, I don't saw that. He came back with the back of his hand. Oh man. You know what? Uh well, my dad told me a long time ago, man, you know, he, you know, he used to live over there on Thomas Avenue and there was a dentist over there, man. His name was Dr. Brown. And they said I remember Dr. Brown. Oh, Dr. Brown, aren't you? Yeah, he was a good dentist, man, but he said he you know, stayed in the dentist's office. <laughs> She stayed in the dentist's office. She stayed in the dentist's office because he kept talking her teeth out, man. <laughs> yeah. I remember his office. He was up there on the Thomas and Hall. Thomas and Hall Street, yeah. So, you know, I've been around it all a lot, man. I know a lot. And there's a lot of stories I've been heard, man. You know, and uh, 
it said that uh basically uh uh like uh we're gonna talk about how big Bo basically started his group you say you, you played with him what what dates now can you remember i started with him i believe in uh 59 and he we were just playing in little cafe like <laughs> hole in the walls is what they were. Y'all saying hole in the walls, <laughs> you know. Yeah, hole in the wall, man. And, I but know. see, as our crowd got, our following got bigger and bigger. So we moved into the big part of the Ascot. Then we had to remodel, Bo had to remodel Ascot to make it hold more people. Then we moved down to the Ascot room, which was the Rose room when we moved in there. And he, he renamed it the Ascot room. And uh, man, we we used to have a thousand people a night on the weekend. We easily have a thousand people, oh. which was quite a, quite a bit of. Now, can you name some, can you name some of the members of that band right there? Oh yeah, James Marsh, James Lynn Marsh, uh, uh, Don Williams, mm -hmm. Oscar Perry. Oscar. Did you know Oscar played saxophone? Yeah, I know why. And, yeah. and the drummer was Charlie Miles. And uh Ariel Griffin played with us for a while. Ariel Griffin, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, oh, he was a vocal player, right? Who, Ariel? Yeah. Ariel was a vocalist. He played drums, but he was mostly a vocalist. A vocalist. You know, he owned that club out on uh, uh Grand Avenue. Yeah, on Grand, right? On Grand. Blue Grand. Yeah. yeah, Blue Salad, right? Yeah. So, uh, when he started this band, now uh, was it any kind of difficulties in starting the band with all those different people in there like that? Man, mm -hmm. I know he had close to about fifteen or twenty members, right? Yeah, off and on, yeah. But uh, when I when I started playing with band uh, with both, he already had five five members in the band mm -hmm. called the set no yeah satisfied six six and uh, yeah when we got in there you know we put this record out called the big bow's twist so we named ourselves big bow and the arrows big bow and the arrows yeah nobody yeah yeah uh I remember a lot of tales people used to tell me. In fact, uh, I met uh, Big Bo's son one time. I was living over there on East Dallas over there, and I saw this big, tall guy with a suit on. And he wore a suit on every day, man. And no matter how hot it was, Little Bo had this big suit on. This was a big blanket, so he'd be shaking. You know, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my dad, you know, my dad kept a big briefcase of money. Yeah, 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 my, yeah. I said, yeah, huh? Yeah, my money. Yeah, <laughs> what do you mean by that? You say his money. So he told me my daddy was a good businessman. You know, my daddy had big bands. He had a big club. No, man, man, I mean, uh, I hear all this now. And I know if a person that's real successful, what was his downfall? You know what I'm saying? I'll tell you exactly what I think downfall was to a lot of black clubs. When the civil rights passed in 64, mm -hmm. black started going, in, going to clubs that had air conditioning. Well, the Ascot Ballroom only had water fans. Oh, man. Yeah, so he wouldn't upgrade the coming in with the water fans inside of burning up. Yeah, girls coming in with their hair all done and leave out like they've been <laughs> raped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of, and, and even in the wintertime, it got so cold in the clubs because he didn't have nothing but those little stoves. Uh, and we, stoves, man. And so in yeah, this, people I, sitting around the stove instead of dancing. Yeah, I hear so some they, stoves get kicked over sometimes and just start burning up, burning up the whole place. <laughs> so they start going to this club on, over there called the Red Jacket. You remember the Red Jacket? Yeah, I'm in Red Jacket. Yeah. Well, they start going around now, and and the drain was just too much. It just kept draining them to finally we didn't have many people in now and uh he wouldn't 
he he wouldn't try to do anything to to build the club, uh, make it modern, modernize the club. He he just wouldn't do it. He put the money in his pocket. Put money in his pocket. I went over there one night. We had been out of town, and he had O. V. Wright over there. Mm-hmm. You remember O. V. Wright? O. V. Wright, yeah. 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 Uh, when we got back, O. V. was O. V. was really pissed hmm. because because somebody had stolen money. Oh man! I know who I know who got the money, but I'm not gonna say. But O. V. was, you know, he was a bad dude anyway. Hmm. And he was ready to take somebody to pieces, so I left. I don't know what happened. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah. you said all this was going on at the same time. All this, you know, insanity. I call it insanity. But this all goes on with black race, blackness. We got a competition level. We all competing against each other. At the same time, we're trying to be successful. So, uh, out of all this competitiveness, where did the the success come in at? Now, I, I heard some of these records and some of the real, the real fine recordings, man. You know, I, I know, you know, you know, there had to be somebody in this group. Basically, was an excellent songwriter. And well, who, I wrote all of my songs. One of yours. I wrote all of them. You wrote all of them. So the music you too. And most of all Big Bo Thomas's tunes. Yeah, the Big Bo twist. He oh. had that melody, but I had the, the beat and the arrangement. So I arranged the song for him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had James Lynn Marsh in there. And that was, a, that was the biggest competitor was writing the band. What did he play? He played trumpet and he was a vocalist. He was a vocalist. So he had oh, really good vocalist. He was like a composer. No, he just he he didn't compose. He just sang and played well, trumpet. They say he was a lot of problems. A lot of people might was trying to pull him in their groups or something, right? Or pulling him in their recordings. Yeah, they had a. They, they broke off one time and went to another club, but they came back. You know, I was on the Ascot label, the Federal label, and the Cotillion label. You know, it came out on Bo's record. Bo had a re- label called Gay Shell. Gay Shell. Oh. Gay Shell label. And what they would do, the companies, when you put out a song, if it's sold enough, they would take it up. And so I had this song called Ride the Iron Horse. Now, you're talking about some bad luck. When I recorded the song, the guys in California at Atlantic Record, I mean in New York, in Atlantic Record, they wanted to. So they got the song and they recorded it and the wax company went on a strike. The company that put the, you know, the mm-hmm. wax company. Yeah. Then when the company about six, six or eight months later, I called to New York and asked them, well, with my record, he said, sitting on the dock, the truck said went on a strike. <laughs> so, mm. so when my record started coming out, guess who got on that label? Aretha Franklin. Oh, so that led, that led me out of it. Oh, man, that is kind of bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm pretty happy now. I don't know if I'd have been this happy if, if I had a made a hit record. I don't think I was ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there any way you uh, uh, ever thought about uh, trying to write uh, some memoirs or anything, or write with somebody or get with you, you know, about I, everything you know about, sir? You know, because it's not the way to, left, man. You know, I started to do that. I started write started to write a book with somebody to help me called The Local Musician because nobody understands the local musician. You know, you see them come in and, yeah. the, but the local musician is the backbone of, back in my day, was the backbone of the music uh, system because, like I said, the black people didn't travel with 
a band. They just came to the club and practiced with the house band. Yeah, I would say it was kind of expensive, man. You know, get everybody on the bus and. Yeah, that was very uh, yeah. Then it's another problem by going for everyone in these little small towns getting jacked right. up by the police, man. You know, so I yeah. understand how 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 talented it was. Uh, you had to have all your talent in one spot. You know, I had an experience like that one time when you know they did us the same way. They made made us come down now. And then later on, they showed up and they wanted us to practice with them. And then we got the tune together. And then after then, we never saw them no more. You know, and they come out later on, they expect for you to, everything got yeah. to be on the one. Everything got to be on the one. You know, on the one, they, they, sometimes they, uh, she had a fit one day and walked off the stage, you know. And that's Who was that? Huh? Who? I don't want to call it name right oh, now. Right. Okay. You know, I, you know, I can't leave that. I, I, I got a little book I'm going to write it. I'm gonna tell about it. my book. I'm writing about some yeah. of my tales. You know, me and John was with him. Me and John was with him. You know, me and John. In fact, John got the gig for us, man. Through a uh, this guy named Iris Wheaton. You know Iris Wheaton, don't you? Yeah, I know Wheaton. He played in the band with us for a long time. Oh man, yeah, Iris Wheaton, man. You know, uh, he's a preacher now. I was going down to North Texas. Uh, Iris was a big time educator man and right now he's got a school man he's a minister man and you wouldn't I know, know. Yeah, yeah and he uh he uh he was one of the i saw a white guy give him one of the highest praises for a black man that i had ever heard him give a black person so i know he had to have a lot of clock to get Compliment from that guy, man. You know, he had a master's degree from North Texas State. That's where the place was at, where we was at. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, he used to write for Stack Records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until they went out, Isaac Hayes and that group down there. And he had a he had a recording studio. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Recording studio. That's basically why I met him, man. And later on, you know, me and John, we went out on a couple of gigs. He sent us everywhere. And I, now I know how hard it is really for a band to basically get paid. That's another thing I want to talk about now. How were y'all paid, man? You know, they tell me, you know, a lot of them, you say they hiding hide the money, your money, and everybody money. How were basically y'all getting paid back in the day? With both, we got paid weekly, like a salary, every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, very weak. Very weakly. <laughs> very weak. <laughs> but seldom. Yeah. No, no, we got paid every week, but you know. He was always short. He was always short. But let me tell you something. We would always get tax and everything. Tax and social oh, tax on your money. Oh, okay. So, right. so when it all came down, the, we didn't get our tax paid. He put the tax money in his pocket. Oh, <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah. And then we wound up having to pay tax. Mm, mm, mm. You know, that's another thing since I've been talking to a lot of musicians. And he was telling us how basically when you get to be an older person, you don't have no kind of social security coming in, man. Cause know, at the man. time you're getting straight money, nobody's waiting back for you. Yep, that's right. And now that's I, see, right. I see what was going on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit about your instruments now. Uh, uh, what was basically your favorite instrument you like to play now? You say you was a guitarist now. What guitar? Yeah, man, I had a B three organ, man. That was my favorite. Oh, you like the B threes, huh? Yeah, I had a B three with two Leslie speakers. Yeah. Do you know how to pull all the stops out and everything, man? Uh, I pull them out till I got the sound I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one thing would scare me away from, man. I just, I look and I say, man, I don't know if anybody learn how to pull all these things out and really know what you're doing, man, you know. You yeah. know, I never used a ball. Yeah. I just had a few sounds that I knew I could count on, and those are the ones I used all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So all right, that's on the that's on the organ now. How about the guitar? What was uh, the guitar, your favorite guitar you like to play on? I had a I had a <laughs> I had a Fender, and uh, when I left Bo's band, he asked me, could he? keep my guitar so his band could use it. Uh, I said, okay. So one day I was walking down the street and the guy told me, he said, Bo is selling all the instruments. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. So I was running around there to try to save my guitar and it was gone. Man. Oh, man. So, I had a saxophone. I loaned it to Al Briggs. He had a wreck and tore that up. <laughs> Oh, you know, that saxophone, uh, you, you know, Fathead Newman. Yeah, I know Fathead. Fathead, uh, Ray Charles never going to, uh, over, going to Europe, and somebody had stole Fathead's horn. So he asked to use my saxophone and took took it to Europe. When he, when he brought it back, man, it was just like a new saxophone, man. Oh, man. And that's when Al got it and tore it up. No, man. <laughs> you know, uh, the guy tell me a lot of these guys, man, when they get involved in these rucker companies, the rucker companies will take care of you, man. They buy you all kinds of instruments and anything wrong with it, they'll go out and get it fixed. You go yeah. overseas, they got these good technicians and, and the instrumental repair people. They'll fix a horn up, man. Especially go yeah. like Germany and Italy, man. They fix the good horns up, man. So he tore your horn up, huh? So basically, how do you go around? How do you go? You get you another one or what? What happened, man? I, just, I let it go. Man. Let it go, man. You know, uh, one time I got a list from England with some of our old records on it. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised at the things they sell over there. Man, they, they were selling our records like mad. Oh, yeah. And not only yeah. selling the records, uh, Mr. Larry, they're getting, they're getting money for them, too. Some of your yeah. tunes, you should be starting getting paid some kind of way, man. I'm just letting you know that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I wrote, I know if you ever heard of the Blossoms. It's a girl singing group called, and they put out a song called No Other Love. Well, I was 15 years old when I wrote that song, No Other Love. And it came out on a capital left label. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a dime. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah. 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 Only thing I got paid for a little bit was I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's uh pull that down as while we go. They got a yeah. couple of records on the on, on the internet, man. That's how I pull that tune off that I was playing when we first came on. And uh uh they got these little blocks on that Ding! so nobody can cobble. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, you hear <laughs> make that sound, man. I lived on a uh soul train one time and they were playing my record called Ride the Iron Horse. And uh I used to look at it all the time, but I never I never copied it off because yeah, that you was sing that melody, man. I think I know that tune, man. Don't ride, don't ride. Yeah. Horse. Iron horse. Yeah, iron she's horse. the iron horse. Yeah, they didn't change the word. They call it the white horse. Nah, that wasn't mine. Iron horse. I'm gonna have to look at that, man. You know. Yeah, it's on. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. thousand miles away on there too. Who? This song I covered called "A Thousand Miles Away." A thousand miles away. Yeah, it's on YouTube too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matter of fact, I got quite a few on that. Some of them sound like crap. <laughs> okay, now, you know, uh, I know when y'all first got in the studio, man, I want you to talk a little bit about how it was going into a recording studio back in that day. Uh, um, how, how, how hard was it making a record, man? Was it an easy thing or was it a uh, kind of a, a, it a, was, a daily thing that you basically had to work on? It was terrible because the studio you go in there, right now in my studio I got in the back, I got a 27 track recorder. When we went to studio downtown, they had two tracks. The band did one and the vocalist did one. 
And if anybody in the band made one mistake, you'd have to do it all over again. Mm. Yeah. And you kept doing that until you got it right. So when did they basically go to the multi channel? You know, I you know the, we didn't go into one that I remember had. I think the the biggest one we had had four channels, four tracks. Four tracks. That, that's you know that was it. Hmm. And the drum used most of those tracks. I think Atlantic Record was one of the first. Uh, recording studio the basement and it was all because of ray charles got him to do it he went on saw all these and heard all these different and he told him to buy them go man go buy them and he started dubbing all these extra stuff you know a lot of vocals and, and the music yeah yeah and that's why atlantic that's has one of the most even on the jazz side it has one of the most uh perfect recording techniques yeah. I ever heard in the records and then a lot of that uh Ray Charles stuff, a lot of fathead stuff, you know. I listen to a lot of it, man. I hear a lot of stuff, man. I said, how did they do that? They, they had all these these technical yeah. stuff. You know, you know Les Paul was the first guy that recorded multi tracks. Who? Les Paul. Les, Les Paul. Paul and Mary Ford. They oh. come up with the multi track. Yeah. They recorded a song called how high the moon how the moon yeah and uh it sounds like a a lot of people on there and it's only two him and his wife him and his wife and i said man this is this is it right here mm -hmm. yeah you know let's fall man a lot of people don't know why that guitar is cut that way man you know because <laughs> his hand was messed up wasn't it oh was it i didn't know that yeah, that's why they designed that guitar player because he couldn't move his hand a certain way, so he had to keep it always at one spot. So they they cut it down so his hand, would, you know, oh. to always be able on his hand. He wouldn't have to move his hand around too much. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> I, that, that, that guitar was designed that way. You know, all of them designed the guitars a certain way. Like, yeah, so he's got one too out now. You know, and uh, uh, what is a what is a white guy name? Uh, uh, one that uh. B.B. King talk, uh, saying the last thing to have him, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, I shouldn't be stopping names right now, but I am. You yeah. know, uh, one of those guys used to live down on the corner from where I live now. Uh, what was his name? Stevie Ray Vaughn. That's it. Stevie Ray Vaughn. He used to live on the corner down there before I moved here. The guy that was in there, he showed that Stevie Ray Vaughn's car. Yeah, yeah, you know, Steve got a long story about what he did too. You know, he lost, he, he learned away a lot from uh, he learned away from uh, what's the guy named play the guitar? I was singing this song, Oh, I'll sing the blues for you. Da -da 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 -da. It wasn't T Bone, was it? No, it was uh, uh, God, Freddie King, no, Albert King. Oh, Albert King. I try to sue. I sing the blues for you. <laughs> that one was bad, man. Yeah, we played. I played with both of those guys. Bad man, Alvin King was bad, man. I was yeah. King was bad. Freddie was too, huh? Freddie Fred King, was yeah, too. Fred was bad too. Fred you know what we used to do on a Friday, on a Saturday, Sunday night when he got off from playing, when we got, we used to go fishing. Freddie King loved the fish. Oh man, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't tell you. We should go up to Lake Levon and fish all night. And oh. we took Johnny Taylor up there one time, and <laughs> man, y'all crazy. He went to sleep. <laughs> man, man, he knows a lot of stories, then, Mister Willard. A lot of them. You know a lot of don't you? You'd be surprised. Uh, I lived in North Dallas where Freddie King man lived that man, and I don't you know, and I always wanted to meet him, but he was always busy, man. I'll see that big tour bus man on the side of the street, and he was always jumping and running. I'll go up on there, I gotta go, sir. I gotta go, sir. Talk to you yeah. later. And he go on the road, man. I said, Golly, man. He was a funny dude, man. He could tell you some crazy stuff. Yeah. But he loved to fish. You know the bass player I used to play with him? 
No. Charles Nugent. You know Charles Nugent, don't you? you know Charles Nugent? Yeah. I went to school with Charles. You went to school with Charles, man. Charles was a good friend of mine, too, man. You know, and Ernie Charles used to give me a chance to play, man, when I used to go up to the Green Plan. Have you ever gone up to the Green Plan Club? Yeah, we used to go yeah. you, when they were on uh, Hall Street. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, you know. Yeah. On Hall Street. Yeah, it was on Hall. Then it moved out on Forest. Forest. And Mr. Parker was like a promoter, right? Yeah. And, you know, his wife had a recipe for stuffed shrimp. Uh huh. And she would never tell anybody. And she, the best stuffed shrimp you ever tasted. She passed away with without telling anybody her recipe. Oh man, you know. Yeah, I, we opened up the Forest Theater with the the impressions. Mm hmm. We were the first group that opened that when they changed it into a, a you know a music place. Yeah. All right, let me give me another question to ask you now. Uh, do you got any? Uh, you got any children, man, and grandkids, man? Got the same talent you got now? Nah. So nobody uh, my, on the talk, Mr. Larry. You know, my grandson. He could have been a musician. He, he he could learn things. I showed him how to play. Bad, bad Leroy Brown on the piano one time and he could play it he played it from then on and he didn't want to learn anything else but he could he he had a a, a mind for it mm -hmm. and then i went up to bishop dunn one time to a, a school play that my daughter was my granddaughter was in and she sang a song a cappella. now i never would do that <laughs> yeah i you got to know a note. You got to be tone center. You got to have almost like perfect pitch. Yes, you have. Because yeah. you'll slide out of tune in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's the one that's going to carry on the touch for you, Mr. Lara. You know, you no. know they always say it's always the third generation that, that carries on, you know. She's uh, 33, man. She, she, that, that, that boat floated away a long time ago. Okay. Well, well let's hope so. Let's hope so. Well, anyway, uh, you told me some exciting stories, man, and I always wanted to know. Uh, can you now give us a little, some little advice for all the musicians and anybody that want to try to make music their livelihood, their life? What are some of the things you think a person should do in order to be a successful musician? Well, well back when we were starting out, to me, it was a lot easier because it was the blues, 12 bars, and then we used to do the ice cream changes, you know, one, six, five, four, five, and it was pretty simple. Now, my advice to anybody, if you want to get in the music business, you better get you some music lessons because music is complicated nowadays. Well, I don't think it's too complicated, Mr. Larry, because I know, and I've been looking at a couple of these advertising on the internet. They got some computers now that can figure out chord structures, and they figure out chord structures, and they layers out, you know, exotic chord structures on the chord structures that you already got. You got these these are uh, sequences and stuff doing all their thinking now, so you can have talent. I would say it's the main thing you got to have. You got to have talent. If you don't have talent, ain't nothing there anyway. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you got to have talent. You got to have something going for you. Later on, if you really lucky, you can get behind people that see the talent inside of you and can help you and refine you without, I would say, not messing out your money too much. You know, they all going to do that a little bit. They're going to get you a little for you. They are trying to help you, you know, and then the next phase it's like different layers that you go up on, you know, yeah. so uh, I see the result every day. I, I see a lot of I hear a lot of people on the radio and I wonder how do they do that? But it's these keyboards they got out nowadays can do anything. Oh, yeah, can do anything, man. I, I got one right here, man. And it's you know, I was looking at that. It, it plays everything, man. I, what is that? I got and then now 
some of the things I always wanted, I just go over and I say, that's how you do that, man. That's how you do it. You know, get you a motif, man. When I was a little boy, I went to see the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. I came back, I told my mother, I said, I'm going to get every instrument I heard. I'm going to get that one day. And then I got me one of those pianos and I've got them. I got them all. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. those pianos will play all of it. So I'm glad to talk to you today, sir. And uh, right now, we're getting ready to sign off. And I really appreciate you coming on my show today. And, uh, and uh, I really admire you. And I'm really proud that you are part of Black history. You know, you're part of the movement of music in Dallas that needs to be showcased. It needs to be something need to be written about. Actually, you can try to need to write a movie or something about what happened back in, in this yeah, time. Man. You know, because, you know, we got one guy that stayed here. He didn't really stay here, but he got famous by living here and letting this be like a sounding point. Ray Charles used Dallas as a kickoff point. You know, yeah, we, yeah, I know we played with Al Green. So uh, we played with Al Green. He had one song out, Backup Train. And he used to come here. He used to be here a couple of times a month at least. Yeah. Uh, and I told him one day, I said, man, with a voice like yours, you're going to be a great singer. And he said, what? He didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. But he's got a unique voice. Yeah, he got a unique voice. It's one of the things I heard when I heard Al Green. I said, I never heard his voice before like that. Right. Right. Moaning and stuff like that. It's yeah, they're squeaking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'd like to thank you for being on the show today, Mr. Fred Lowry. You're Fred Lowry Jr., right? Fred Lowry, period. Fred Lowry. I'm the senior. You're the senior, yeah. There yeah. you go. Fred Lowry senior. I well, like man, I'm glad you got me on your show. And uh, I appreciate all those compliments, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're part of history. You're part of history. And right now, we're signing off, and I'd like to thank Mr. Fred Lowry for being on our show today and thank you very much and I wish you long life, man. Live long, enjoy your life, man. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't interrupt everything.